Hello wonderful viewer, welcome to What The Math, this is Anton and you're looking at Pluto. Today we're talking about a series of objects in our solar system known as Plutinos. What are they? You're going to find out. Welcome to What The Math. <laughs> Now, despite the name, which is, of course, Plutino, uh, most of the Plutinos actually have very, very little in common with Pluto itself, other than the way that they orbit in our solar system. So I'm going to accelerate time here just to show you that this is actually Pluto. We were on the side of Pluto that you or me have not actually seen before, which hasn't really been captured by um, any of our telescopes or any of our satellites yet, but the other side we're all familiar with. It's been shown to us previously and uh, we have seen pictures of it already. Anyway, so what exactly are Plutinos? Let's actually um, use Universe Sandbox try to, to try to find out what exactly they are. But before we go into Universe Sandbox, I wanted to actually do the following. I wanted to show you examples of some of them, some of the famous ones, just so you can kind of see what they look like in Space Engine. So obviously there's Pluto, there's also the Pluto's anti-hero, or I guess villain, by the name of Orcus, which I've talked about previously. And Orcus is of course known as anti-Pluto. This is what it looks like here. So this is another Plutino. And just try to think about what exactly do you think makes them so similar? So what, what exactly do you think Plutino is before I actually tell you? So there's Orcus with its um, moon Vanth. And we have a few more that are named uh, here. We have one called Ixion, which is right here. This is Ixion, beautiful, beautiful Ixion. Very gorgeous um, dwarf planet in Space Engine full of redness, which is, of course, formed by um, uh, tholines, which are sort of derivatives of methane that are usually formed on uh, dwarf planets because of the sun interaction. And then we have another named one called Huya, and this is Huya. So as you can see, they're all kind of similar looking, but there's still nothing really uh, that makes them too similar, at least in my opinion, and that's because Plutinos are not actually similar in terms of composition or size or appearance. They're similar in their orbit. And here's actually another Plutino that's uh, known for its sort of interesting quasi-circular orbit. This is... Um, it's actually a frozen asteroid here. It's an asteroid known as 2007JH43. So as you can see, this one looks very, very different from other Plutinos. And it's not even that circular. But this is also a Plutino, and so is this next one that I'm about to show you. Known as 2003VS2. It has really, really cool looking craters here. And it's almost like moon-like in appearance, except, of course, it, once again, it's not very spherical because it's technically a very, very large asteroid that is about 360 kilometers in diameter. So it's a very large asteroid that would very likely destroy all life on Earth if, if it ever came back, or not came back, but came and crashed on our on surface on our, of our planet. Which is very, 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 very unlikely to ever happen because it's just not going to be very easy to project this asteroid toward our planet and make it collide with it. And so let's actually investigate these Plutinos in Universe Sandbox so that you can actually kind of visually see what makes them special. So it all depends on how objects orbit in regards to Neptune. Neptune is very, very important because it's, uh, it's a very massive ice giant. And uh, a lot of the trans-Neptunian objects, which are right here, basically all of these objects orbiting after Neptune, have actually been influenced by it over time to either kind of escape into the outer uh, Kuiper's belt and also maybe even Oort's cloud, which is really, really far away from us, or to acquire a kind of a resonance. Basically, what resonance refers to is uh, a pattern of orbits. And the specific resonance that we're talking about here is called 2 to 3. What this suggests is this. I'm gonna just visual uh, help you visualize this by taking, let's do this Orcus and, and Neptune. Uh, or actually, no, let's start with Pluto. Where is Pluto? Pluto, where are you? There you are. So we're going to wait for Pluto and Neptune to align first. And right here, there we go. So they're almost aligned. So what I'm going to do is basically let go of, uh, well, actually, let's just focus on the sun first. Let go of Neptune. And so this is where Neptune and Pluto are in line. After three orbits of Neptune, and after two orbits of Pluto, they're going to come back into exactly the same spot. And this is what we refer to as two to three resonance. So just count the orbits. Neptune orbit number one, Neptune orbit number 
to and Neptune orbit number three. And as you can see, Neptune and Pluto are back in alignment again. Now this, just this, nothing else is what makes these objects Plutino, because Pluto is actually the first object that we've discovered that had that. And then we realized that many more objects um, in solar system happen to have this as well. So like I mentioned before, Ixion is also one of them. So just watch, there's a line right here. We're going to let go of them and Neptune orbit number one, Neptune orbit number two and the last orbit. So as soon as the last orbit occurs, Ixion should be right where it was before and boom, here it is. So these are what we call Plutinos. There's actually a lot of them, a lot more than you can even imagine and a lot more that we have discovered. And it's not just dwarf planets, it's actually just asteroids as well. And um, the reason why this actually occurred over time is because, uh, well, first of all, Neptune used to be much closer to the sun and as it migrated toward this location right here, it kind of started influencing all of these asteroids and either kicked them out completely. So like, for example, um, what's the other really, really famous dwarf planet? I guess Eris. So Eris is an example of not a Plutino. It doesn't actually have any resonance because Neptune did influence it, but there is no actual two to three resonance. So as you can see, I can roll this for a few times and the alignment of these two objects is not going to happen until quite a long time. So there's an alignment right there, but um, it's not a two to three resonance. And two to three resonance is actually very, very stable. It doesn't change even after billions of years. And um, so the gravitational influence of Neptune, which is about 17 times mass of Earth, so it's a very massive planet, uh, caused uh, a lot of these uh, dwarf planets, a lot of these asteroids to acquire this 2 to 3 resonance. And this is what we refer to as Plutino. And let me just show you some of the other ones. Uh, let's actually go into another simulation here known as um, solar system non-moons over 200 kilometers. We're going to remove all the trails and I'm going to select Neptune and a few other Plutinos that I, I can kind of see here and you get to kind of see their orbit only and not the other orbits because I've disabled other orbits. So we have Neptune, Ixion, Orcus, uh, 2003, 3AZ84 and 2003-3VS2. Let's accelerate time and you'll see that all of these objects have a, the actual resonance with Neptune. And they have a really, really cool orbit. So Neptune actually influences their orbit quite dramatically and they'll start wobbling around um, which is kind of what you see on the screen right now. This is actually what this wobble looks like. And this is only with Orcus and Pluto, but all of these objects have this kind of a wobble. And uh, for every two Neptune orbits, they will have three orbits of their own. And you can kind of check this by basically pausing this video and taking a look at it yourself. Now, so what's really interesting about this is they all have an orbit that's approximately 247.3 years uh, long, which is about 1.5 times the orbit of Neptune. And most of them really don't have any uh, or that much eccentricity. The eccentricity here is between 10 to 30 percent and uh, the highest eccentricity is 0.33, which is actually really interesting because if you get anything more than that, the orbit becomes unstable and all of these objects sort of start flying into a completely different orbit, either acquire a different resonance or become like some of these other objects like Maki Maki and Haumea, for example, they don't have any resonance at all. Or that's not exactly true. They, their resonance is just very, very complex and very different from uh, the resonance of Plutinos. And all of them are named after mythological underworld creatures. So even the, the ones that don't actually have the names yet will eventually receive a name of some kind of a mythological scary creature from the underworld, either Roman mythology or Greek mythology or Norse mythology. And uh, most of them are basically really scary creatures. So essentially, this is what Plutinos are. There are uh, a variety of really cool objects that essentially have similar orbital patterns and um, have acquired these patterns only because of one planet, which is, of course, Neptune that, right here. And this is the planet that's responsible for a lot of crazy things that are going on in outer solar system. Anyway, hopefully you learned something from this video. And if you did, don't forget to subscribe, share this video with your friends and leave a like if you've enjoyed watching it. I'll see you guys in the next video where we're going to talk about something else spacey and educational. Game you later. Bye-bye.